YouTube channel uh, later on. Uh, we are up and running. So just a bit of uh, some uh, housekeeping items. Uh, and those of you that have joined us, uh, you've been doing a great job in the past. Uh, if you were new, um, we do appreciate if you can keep your microphone on mute. Um, this this is uh, helps not only the speaker, but also um, you know uh, the other folks that are joining us. Uh, and please keep your uh, video off also. Uh, this will cut down on bandwidth and it just makes for a, a better presentation. Uh, as I mentioned, we are recording this, so um, uh, you'll be able to view this later if you wish to refer to it or if you want to uh, let, let your friends know about it. Um, you can turn around and uh, watch it on our YouTube channel later on. Uh, you will receive a survey. Uh, this this helps us in providing uh, it, it. We enjoy that feedback and it, it gives us a, a good idea of uh, uh, potential future programs, uh, lectures that we can pull together. So um, with that being said, uh, we can see here the uh, list. So we were a little bit shortened for November and December with the holidays coming on. Uh, but the, today, um, I am Paul Winsky uh, with uh, AgriLife Extension. I am the horticulture agent, and I will be talking on uh, plant disease identification. Uh, next week, we will have uh, fall gardening chores. Fall gardening chores. Uh, Mr. Shannon Dietz, our Ag and Natural Resources agent, uh, will be speaking on that. Um, a very time. Uh, uh, appropriate topic holiday plant care will be covered by Brandy Keller on the 19th, right before the holiday. Uh, on the third, we're going to have Amanda Cripple, uh, who is our FCH agent, and she's going to speak on uh, food pre uh, preservation. Uh, this is going to be a follow up to the food safety. Uh, we had some positive feedback on that, so uh, she's agreed to come and speak again. And then on the 10th, we're going to do something different. We're just going to open, have an open forum. Uh, we may have some slides on uh, topics that or I, questions that we've had, um, but if you have questions or um, uh, you'll be able to post them and ask us. Uh, the three of us will be on and uh, it will we'll see how it goes. We haven't done an open forum, but uh, it will be ask an agent. So um, we're, lo we're looking forward to that um, to, to round out things uh, before the holidays. So uh, let's get started. Plant disease identification. Uh, everyone's always got uh, questions about plant diseases. Sometimes they are misdiagnosed. And what we want to do today is help you out, help you understand what to look for uh, if it is a plant disease or maybe if it's uh, an, another, an abiotic issue like we, we like to uh, call it. Um, so what is a plant disease? Um, it's really an alteration uh, of that plant and it interferes with its normal appearance yellowing leaves, blotching, uh, functioning, all right? It's got a wilting look to it, um, but you know you've watered it. So something is going on there. And ultimately it, it, it uh, affects the value or it's unfit uh, for its normal use. So if you're a greenhouse grower, you're not gonna be able to sell that. You can't ship it. Um, uh, if you are got it in the landscape, uh, it doesn't look good. Uh, it, it's not doing what it's supposed to do. It's, 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 uh, it, it just has that blah look to it. There, there's something going on. Um, I, I like this next uh, quote. I just read an article, Paul Pilon. He is a, uh, a perennial guru. He's got a, a business perennial solutions consulting. And I thought it was appropriate for today. And his quote is, uh, we use fungicides for bad cultural practices, not because of the diseases. And so if you really think about that, you know, the ball is in our court. Uh, we know we've got to deal with the environment and things like that, but are we putting our plants in the best light? Are we offering them the best conditions or um, do we have them planted too closely? or um, we're not getting enough airflow, or we're watering them late at night and they're going to bed with wet feet, wet foliage, uh, and things like that. So um, sometimes we are our own worst enemies. Now I know environment and rain and things like that and our humidity, we, we just have to deal with that, but there's things that we can do in order to give our plants in the landscape or in pots or wherever um, the best uh, chance at being able to avoid um, these diseases. So 
Um, this is one I, I just want you to remember that, you know, we use fungicides for bad cultural practices, not because of the diseases, okay? Um, there are two kinds of diseases, okay? We have infectious diseases uh, in our plants, and these are transmissi transmissible from plant to plant. Uh, and these are caused by pathogens. So when we talk about transmissible, they can be transmitted uh, via water droplets. They can be transmitted sometimes via wind. Um, when the spores are right, ready, um, they can be transmitted from insects. Uh, insects are great vectors for passing on uh, viruses um, and other things uh, that can uh, negatively affect the, our plant growth. But then we also have this other area, these non-infectious, this disorder that's caused by uh, unfavorable physical environments, okay, that effect. And so sometimes we have issues where people think that it's, uh, it's a disease uh, and they start treating it with a fungicide, um, but really it's a, uh, um, a fertility issue. Uh, or we had uh, low temperatures, or it got dry, or 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 something uh, to that effect that it could show uh, present itself maybe as a infectious disease, but in fact it really isn't, and it, it's a different disorder. And so this is the challenge, and this is why when we get calls or um, uh, people send us emails, sometimes we come back with a load of questions, a lot of questions, because we really need to drill down and find out what is that root cause that is causing this issue. So if we look at this, what, what makes plants sick? Okay, and, and we, we sort of call this the uh, plant disease donut. Uh, and it, it's really kind of nice the way it uh, breaks things down. So uh, in the center, we, we talk about disease in the broad sense, but then we break it down into these uh, three different areas. All right. So uh, here on the right, we talk about our diseases uh, and they're and they're caused by, you know, viruses or viroids. We can see bacteria, fungi, parasitic plants, nematodes. And right on that border there between disease and injury, we have insects and mites because they can be vectors um, for some of these um, diseases. So they can carry them. They they go in with their uh, their mouth part uh, in their uh, saliva or, or they leave it behind or they inject it uh, and the disease can then uh, establish in that plant. Uh, and then we have injury, which, which are usually pretty easy in most cases. You know, insect injury, we can usually tell if we've got caterpillars, they're chewing the edges of the, uh, the leaf. Uh, we can usually tell that. We can tell mite damage and things like that. There's other herbivores uh, that could be out there, you know, uh, small animals that might feed on it. Um, we, then we come over here uh, to the left side under injury, and we, 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 we've got drought, which is sort of right on the border there, along with heat or frost. And these are usually easy easier to tell um, when you have that uh, issue. Um, mechanical impact, you know, if, if there's uh, some, we've got wind issues or things like that, these can also cause injury, um, but we can usually narrow that down. If, if, if an event occurred at a certain time and then we see uh, the aftermath of it, um, we, we can usually attribute it to that. These disorders on the left side, this is where, you know, it, it can it can look one way. People may think it's a disease, but really it could be, um, in certain cases, air pollutants, um, other chemicals. Herbicide drift is, is a classic here, um, uh, especially when it comes to uh, putting out, you know, weed and feeds in your lawns and things like that. Um, it, it could definitely uh, mask or present itself uh, potentially as a disease. Um, soil acidity and alkalinity, all right, what's going to happen there? As our pH shifts one way or another, certain minerals or nutrients can be tied up or become toxic at higher levels and show up in the foliage. And we're going to think it's a disease. We're going to treat it with a fungicide. But really, we're and and we're not seeing any response because that's not the root cause. The root cause is the pH, nutrient imbalances, which could be caused by the acidity and the alkalinity. Uh, and when we talk about low oxygen, we're talking about that in the soil. We're, we're it's growing too wet, and so we're seeing some issues that water uptake isn't occurring. Um, 
root growth isn't occurring the way we want it to. Uh, and and uh, of course, nutrients and, and, and water aren't moving through the plant. Uh, so then we run into some issues uh, on that spectrum. So what parts of the plant can be affected by disease and pathogens? Basically the whole plant, and this is the challenge. Um, you know, from the roots on up to the growing tips, uh, out into the fruits and the flowers, um, we can have uh, issues. Uh, diseases can present themselves. So you can see uh, just in this diagram here on the left side is what the healthy uh, plant side of the plant would look like. We've got great looking foliage. Uh, the roots look happy. Uh, the stem is nice and, and, and you know, uh, it presents itself well. We can see some uh, uh, flowers on the end. We can see fruit production on the end. But then we come to the other side. This is almost like a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde plant. Um, we've got poor root growth, um, so we've got issues there. So something's going on in the soil. Uh, crown gall, which is caused by a bacterium, which is going to affect uh, nutrient and water flow up and down. Uh, we can see this wilting. So this is one of the biggest issues when we see these wilts. Uh, is it caused by the roots? Is it caused by a um, uh, a problem, um, uh, a bacterium or a fungi that are, are causing that to wilt? Uh, are we overwatering? And so these are some of the things we've got to narrow down in order to uh, be able to make a, a good diagnosis. Um, we can see cankers here where part of that bark or part of that stem uh, could could have been either damaged or there is a uh, pathogen that's causing it. And then we see, you know, especially if you grow tomatoes, we can see uh, fruit rots. Um, we can see spotting on it. Sometimes this can be caused by an insect. Uh, other times it is a pathogen. And then we can see, see um, blights here where uh, just that new growth doesn't look quite right. It doesn't open all the way. Um, it just doesn't look real happy, as I like to say. So um, the main thing I want you to take away from today is, is, is to, to look at the big picture, um, not just focus on uh, the initial symptom, because you've got to sometimes take a couple steps back uh, and, and, and understand maybe what the plant is going through or what's happened around the plant in order to be able to determine exactly uh, what the issue is. So the first thing, um, and this is, this is uh, Plant Pathology 101, the disease triangle. In order for a disease to occur, we have to have these three um, uh, areas working together. All right, we have to have a susceptible host. So what does that mean? Uh, we've got a plant that for some reason might be stressed and our plants in this area can be stressed quite often. OK, so we have a susceptible host. We have a plant that isn't uh, growing well. It's not healthy. And this is why when we talk about um, when you purchase plants, you want to make sure you're starting with a healthy plant. Uh, don't buy something that is stressed, that is root bound, that's got some issues because you could be setting yourself up for problems down the road. So we have a susceptible, susceptible host um, and then we have to have a conducive environment. What does that mean? Um, we're in Houston, lots of humidity, lots of rain, uh, and that is usually the key problems. Uh, poor air movement. Uh, if you've got a landscape that's too overgrown and, and you're not getting good air movement through it. So it's, it, it's an environment where, as we come across, the last leg is you've got to have the pathogen. Um, it's got to be, that pathogen's got to be in the area, it's got to be available, uh, and it's got to be ready to grow. And so if we have the pathogen and the environment is ideal and we've got a host that is stressed, that is susceptible, then um, we find that sweet spot here in the middle where the disease will present itself and we will start to see those symptoms uh, on that plant. You know, if we just have a conducive environment, we get a lot of rain or we have a lot of humidity, but we've got a healthy plant. And maybe we even have the pathogen in the area, but if that plant is healthy, it's growing, it's thriving, a lot of times it's not even going to be an issue. It's not going to be a problem. Um, the same uh, issue is if we've got uh, a susceptible host um, and we've got a pathogen, but the environment is not quite right for that pathogen to grow, 
we're not going to see that disease present itself. OK, so these three legs of this stool of this triangle, we have to have a susceptible host, conducive environment and the pathogen. All three of those things have to come together uh, in order for that disease to present itself on the plant. All right, and here's just the typical uh, here's a disease cycle. Uh, this is for early blight on tomato. And uh, so we can see here we, we, we've got um, you know, over seasoning. We, we've got some of these spores that are left over in the debris. This is why we always talk about cleaning up uh, your gardens between seasons or before something else goes in. Don't leave anything that might be diseased uh, laying around. Bag it up and get it out of there. Don't even put it in your compost if it's got disease issues. All right, because uh, we don't want those potential spores that could cause problems down the road. So we have the spores and then the next thing you know, uh, conditions are ideal. Uh, we've got a young seedling here, say, um, could be susceptible. Its, its systems aren't all up and running yet um, and it's inoculated. Uh, and so what happens is that the, the spores get in, uh, they start to grow, uh, they go through their reproductive stage and then we end up with more, more spore. We have the lesions and we end up with uh, more spores. What happened? They, do they do? There's other plants in the area. Uh, it is in this case dispersed uh, by the wind or the rain. Uh, and then these other plants start to show these symptoms. You can see the spores land on the foliage and we've got some more issues. What happens again, like anything else, it's, it's, it's going to try to reproduce. Uh, so that canidia or that spore lands on the leaf surface. Conditions are ideal. Uh, and then the next thing you know, uh, if uh, or, or any other tissue like that, it, it, it just starts to multiply itself. So um, we've, we see the disease, it presents itself, but then what happens is here, we've got potential reinfection. So this whole cycle can start again. And that's where uh, when you're controlling or, or you're trying to get a handle on this, where can you break this cycle? Um, and that's the main key. So, you know, over here by the over over seasoning, it, it's 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 left behind in the debris. If you clean up uh, properly and you bag it and you get it out of there, um, you're going to start off on a, a much better uh, footing. If you've got healthy transplants that are going in uh, and they are ready to, to grow and thrive, um, you're going to be in much better shape. So you always, whether, you know, I talked about beneficial insects and I talk about IPM, the same thing happens with diseases. Uh, you, you have to understand the cycle and then where can you attack or break that cycle in order to get the upper hand uh, on the disease? All right, quick question. Uh, and you can post these answers um, in, in the chat box if you want. Uh, that'll work kind of nice. Um, what are the three factors needed in the development of a plant disease? Is it one, it has to have host, water, and a fungus? Two, is it, a, it needs a host, a pathogen, and the environment? Is it three, it has to have the pathogen, the environment, and a bug? Or is it four, none of the above? Okay, let's see, twos, twos, twos. And I see some of them are master gardeners, so they remembered their plant pathology. Excellent. Yes, the answer is number two. So as we said, that triangle, you need the host, it's gotta be susceptible, you need the pathogen, and then you need the ideal environment uh, for all three of those to come together in order for that disease to present itself uh, on the plant. OK, excellent. Great. So let's talk about fungi. Um, fungi, they're filamentous organisms. Um, for the most part, they are micro microscopic, but some produce large structures such as the toadstools and the mushrooms. OK, and we see them. They, they occur in our lawns, especially if there is a high organic matter or if there's very wet conditions, uh, we will see them. Uh, the interesting thing is there's over 100,000 fungal species. Um, most of them are beneficial or they're benign. Uh, and there's only out of that 100,000, there's only 8,000 fungal species that cause plant diseases. So 8%. So it's a very small percentage uh, of the fungi that are, that are out there in the world um, that will cause problems for the plants that we're growing. 
Uh, so it, it and but it always seems like you know they always seem to find those plants. And again, if if the conditions are right, uh, those spores will find it and cause some problems. So um, most of the the uh, diseases occurring in the landscape in the landscapes are caused by fungi. All right, so most of our problems are fungal related. We do have some bacterial. Uh, very rarely we'll see some viral is, it, virus issues and things like that. Uh, so 85% of plant diseases are caused by fungi. So you can see here, um, this is probably part of a fairy ring. Uh, is it really a major problem? Usually not because once conditions dry out, we usually don't see any major issues with it. Um, the, the picture up here in the upper right hand, this is hypoxyl and canker, which we will see uh, a lot of times in our trees, but we normally see it after um, extreme drought conditions. Uh, so if you go back, I guess it was what, 2011 or whenever we had some extremely uh, bad drought uh, seasons, um, we started to see a lot of hypoxyl and canker, but we didn't see that canker for about, uh, at least in, in most cases, about two years after the fact. So a lot of people were figuring, well, the drought's gone, uh, it shouldn't be an issue, but really we were seeing um, uh, this rear its head, usually when the plant goes under an extreme stress. And then the other one here uh, we could see is, is botrytis. Uh, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, as we work our way through. So how do these grow? All right, so uh, we talked about the conidia or the spores, they'll land on the surface, uh, they'll, they'll germinate similar to you know what a seed does it, it puts out this uh, structure of hyphae uh, it'll attach and then it'll penetrate into the surface of the leaf uh, it will grow establish itself um, thrive because of the conditions and then it, it will go into a reproductive stage where it will sporulate so it will break its way through these spores will uh, emerge uh, whether it's wind or water will carry them and this is where um, we, we start to see major outbreaks when it goes into that sporulation stage because then um, there's there's thousands of these spores and all it needs is the right conditions again and it will start to perpetuate itself so understanding how a fung uh, a fungus grows uh, is again a key to understanding how you might be able to uh, break that cycle and control it all right so here's botrytis on uh, here's here it is on poinsettia now these are extreme cases I, I hope it never gets to this stage, uh, any of these images, but it, it, it may, especially uh, here is a zinnia uh, with the botrytis. You can see the, uh, the hyphae or, or, or the, the, the hairs growing on it. Um, and, you know, if water sits in there for too long and the spores are available, you know, they'll, they'll wipe out those, those uh, flower buds. And here you can see it on um, marigolds. Um, a, a plant that doesn't self clean, you know, maybe this is where deadheading uh, would have uh, avoided this. Um, if the plant, uh, if the flower after the fact was, um, uh, you know, you had deadheaded it, uh, it, it wouldn't have been susceptible to these spores. Uh, here we can see in this one, uh, this foliage was probably the problem here was um, it, it probably didn't have the airflow. Uh, and so conditions were ideal for those spores to attach. Uh, and grow and really just do a number on the uh, lower foliage here. So this is probably one of the biggest issues uh, that we see, especially with herbaceous plants is, is botrytis. Now, if we talk about uh, diagnosing uh, fungal diseases, usually they're pretty easy uh, to tell either with without, you know, without a, a microscope or a lens or with, with some magnification, but you can see some, you know, it's easy to see here. We've got some spores on this upper uh, right um, uh, leaf. Uh, we, we have uh, the area that's infected uh, and these spores, uh, this is, it's, it's in that reproductive stage. Um, and so that's where we want to break that cycle. We don't want it to get to that reproductive stage because then we can have, uh, you know, a lot more issues. Uh, we can see it here again on this this image here on the uh, left. Um, we can see this uh, uh, 
area of uh, infection here, and we can see that it, it that it is beginning to go into that reproductive stage, um, which, which is going to cause us more problems. Here on turf, we can see some rust issues. Okay, um, and it, rust is a is a type of fungus, uh, and it's uh, you know that those spores are are there and they're they're ready. Uh, whether you come through with a mower uh, and you cut that off, and then you carry it along the rest of your um, uh, rest of your lawn or, or it mulches in, um, those spores are there and it's a, just another source to keep that cycle uh, going. All right, now let's talk a little bit about uh, bacterial diseases. So these are uh, simple signal celled organisms. Uh, there's approximately 9,000 uh, bacterial species that have been described uh, and only about 80 species are plant pathogens. Okay, so uh, again, another a very small pop population uh, sector of that group uh, causes our, us the problems. Um, uh, bacteria, they're, they're a completely different, I'm going to say animal, they're not animals, but it's a completely different uh, uh, life cycle, uh, presents itself differently. It's got this gummy material around the outside. Uh, it has, if you remember from freshman biology, it has a flagella, so you can see these arrows and you can see, hopefully you can tell uh, that that little whip-like structure that it uses, uh, whether it's in water or any kind of fluid, uh, to move itself around. Uh, and here you can see, you know, this is a bacterial disease on this geranium. Um, but somebody that isn't aware, uh, they, they may think that I just need to put more water on there and I keep watering, I keep watering, I keep watering, and I keep having this issue. Uh, and, it, and in this case, it is a, a bacterial issue. So it's, it's, it's understanding, you know, what are some of the signs if it's bacterial versus, uh, you know, a drought situation. All right, so how do they reproduce bacteria? They divide asexually. It's called binary fission. So if you have one, it splits in two, and then those two split, and then those. So it's just like the old commercial, and then they told two friends, and so on, and so on, and so on. So they can go through this process very rapidly. Uh, and in ideal conditions, uh, they can divide every 20 minutes. So at that rate, um, one bacterium, uh, can produce 100 million bacteria in a time span of about 10 hours. So, you know, these are the challenges. This is what, you know, we are dealing with uh, if we have the right conditions uh, for these plants uh, or, or for these diseases. Okay. All right. So how do we diagnose? What, how do we know if, it, if it's bacterial? Um, so with the fungi, um, you could see it, it would spread out through the entire plant. Um, it, it, it wasn't really well defined where if it's bacterial, it will stay within, you know, in between the veins. Um, it will look almost mosaic like. OK, now we 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 often use the term mosaic like when it's if it's got uh, virus issues. But you can see here on, on this, the, the larger image below here how it stays very confined um, within the, you know, uh, structure of the leaf. Uh, it's not bleeding out. It's staying uh, within a very set area. Uh, you don't see it washing across. It, it hits the main vein here. It stops and then it's very blocky. So that's one of the ways um, uh, the, the tips that we can look at to, to see if it's bacterial or fungal. Uh, the other way is uh, if you cut the tissue or if you cut the stem and you were to just put it in and dip it the end in uh, like a tube of water or, or some water that you could see, um, you can see here, here's a, here's a stem that's, that's got some uh, bacterial issues. And where that line is, as, a, as you follow it down, you can see the bacterial streaming or oozing out of there. Uh, the same with this piece of leaf tissue. You can see this, it almost looks like a halo, this cloud. Um, and that is the bacterial, uh, the spores uh, streaming out of there. So this is one quick and easy way uh, to help you decide or determine, you know, am I de dealing with a bacterial issue or is it a fungal issue? If it's a fungal issue, you're not going to see this occur. Um, but if it is bacterial, you will see that. Uh, and then if you send samples on, you know, say to the to the lab 
to confirm it up at A&M. Uh, they can grow it out. Uh, they can give you an, an exact uh, uh, name and ide identify that pathogen uh, for you if needed. Um, when we talk about bacteria, we often talk about blights. Uh, and they, they normally have sort of that, that um, as we call the, it, it almost looks like a, a water soaked spotting to it. So you can see it, it's staying within uh, the structures, but it just looks like it's, it's, it's been wet for too long. Uh, and so here's three examples. This one's kind of nice with it being backlit. You can see it further along here uh, on the left side, but you can see here that it's occurring also uh, in this area. Uh, so this is, is, is one of the reasons or, or one of the clues uh, to help you determine uh, if it's bacterial or fungal. All right, so we talked about fungal diseases, uh, some, some of the how to identify. We talked about bacterial. Um, let's touch quickly on um, control principles. How, how are we going to control these? So we, we've got these uh, six topics here we'll go through, we talk about resistance, exclusion, protection, eradication, avoidance, and therapy, okay? So what does that all mean? So if we talk about resistance, um, we're going to talk about the plant we're starting with. We're going to talk about the genetics of it. Um, we're going to talk about, uh, especially with tomatoes, uh, as you can see in this, this image here, um, Better Boy, Hybrid, VFN. What does that VFN mean? It means it's resistant to verticillium, fusarium, and nematodes, okay? So uh, things like that, we see this, this Snapdragon, uh, it's resistance to rust, okay? So resistance doesn't mean it's, it can't get it, um, but it's, it's, it's going to be tougher for that, those rust um, spores to, to really establish on that plant because there's something inside that plant. Uh, the breeders have been able to figure out certain varieties may are more resistant than other ones. Uh, and the same thing here with the zinnia, uh, we, we talk about, um, you know, mildew resistant. Um, so there it's, and, and resistance is, there's always a sliding scale on that. So you always have to, there's resistance and then there's tolerance. And that's always the, the key. Um, if we can get through with tolerant varieties where you might see a little bit of it, but it doesn't affect, the, it doesn't affect the overall quality of the plant, then, you know, I'm good with that. If we if we can get to the resistance part where it doesn't see, you know, we don't see it at all, and we, and we are seeing that with some of the uh, coravincas now that they're resistant to aerial phytophthora, that's even better. Um, then there's ind indirect uh, resistance. So you know, we talk about some of these adapted traits. You know, they they're they're drought tolerant, things like that. So if they're drought tolerant, um, it's not the plant's going to be healthier. It's not going to be susceptible. So we're not going to see um, possibly some of these spores and some of these diseases attacking that plant because the plant's going to be healthier. Like everything else, there's some caveats. Uh, and that is, you know, where are you finding this information and how reliable is it? Uh, so if you're looking at this with the seed companies um, where you're getting your packets, um, they've, you got to, I would say you, you're going to feel good about that. Um, but always, you know, make sure you're confirming uh, things like that, um, you know, especially uh, with the tomatoes, um, you know, I, the way the industry is now, every, everything, if they say it's, you know, VFN uh, resistant, um, I, I feel good with, with that information. Um, but you, you've always got to make sure and, and double check because a lot of the companies are selling, you know, the same varieties. You want to uh, make sure is, is it resistant? Is it tolerant? And, and where was it trialed if you can find that information out? Well, we're doing much better. The seed companies and the universities are doing much better trialings across uh, the various regions. Uh, so whether we're in the deep south, uh, on the west coast, up in the northeast, things like that. Uh, so resistance is, is one of the ways uh, to combat some of these diseases. The other one is exclusion, all right? So how do we keep it out? You know, are we, are we starting with, with healthy plants? If you're a grower, are you buying certified plant material that you know is clean? Um, you can see up here, are we maintaining our equipment? Even as a gardener, are you cleaning your tools after? 
um, say you pruned off a stem that that didn't look real good. Are you cleaning that that um, those clippers, uh, or you just pop, pop them back in your uh, you know back pocket, and the next thing you know, you're cutting it some, you're using it to to prune something else. You could inadvertently be passing along uh, spores that could cause problems down the road. So try to keep that area uh, as clean as possible. And you can see even up here, and I'm sure, you know, when we were traveling, and if you traveled international, you would see these dogs uh, as you're coming in through baggage claim. Um, they're looking for plants. They're looking for anything that um, could potentially be a problem. You know, uh, if you ever fly through Miami, you're going to see them quite often because stuff is coming up from South America, um, any of the big international hubs. Whenever uh, I would fly to Holland and you come in from Holland, uh, you'd always see these dogs around because they just want to make sure that people aren't bringing plant material that could potentially be diseased. Uh, and even if you travel, you know, uh, within the country, interstate, um, you know, if you're coming from a, a high agriculture area, Texas to Florida or Texas to California, where agriculture is a big, big, uh, you know, money producer for them, uh, they don't want certain things uh, being brought, brought in, you know, especially if it's citrus. Um, you know, Harris County is in a quarantine area for uh, citrus greening. So we are not supposed to buy, you know, if we buy a, a citrus tree in Harris County, um, we should not be taking it over to Austin to plant because um, they are not a quarantine area and we could potentially be bringing citrus greening into the area. So um, exclusion is is really key. Um, if we got healthy, healthy plants and we can exclude it, uh, make sure we're, we're working with clean equipment, that's a plus. Then there is protection, all right? So there are, are times where we've got to come in and, and we've got to treat it, whether it's chemically with fungicides, um, biological barriers. Uh, and that's the, down here where we can look at um, uh, treating with, with these some of these uh, soil additives that will improve uh, root growth uh, and protect the plant. And so you can see where uh, we've got our check, uh, we've got the, without the uh, soil amendment, germination wasn't that great, but with the uh, the BioGuard, uh, Rhizoctonia was introduced and those plants are still thriving. So there are biological barriers out there that growers or you can incorporate into your soil to help. And then there's physical barriers. So maybe instead of growing on the ground, we're growing up in these raised beds where um, we've got a little bit better control. Uh, and we're not going to have as many issues. So protection is the other key. Uh, if we've got a problem, we, we may have to eradicate. OK, so we've got images here where we're solarizing. Maybe we've got nematode problems or maybe there is uh, some other issues. So we're going to solarize that soil. We're going to take it out of production, let Mother Nature help us in the heat of the summer and just bake the heck out of that soil in order to kill off the potential pathogens. Uh, here we can see in a golf green where they are treating um, for nematode problems uh, and they're actually doing an in injection. Uh, and last but not least with the eradication, if, if you've got uh, areas that are, uh, um, you, you've got some disease material, get them out of there. Sweep them out, clean them up, bag them up, uh, don't compost uh, and, and, and get rid of it. Get rid of that source of potential spores. Uh, the other one is another one here is avoidance. OK, so how, how can we trick or, or, or work around the potential problems of these uh, pathogen? Whether we, you know, we talk about rotating our planting uh, schedule, um, not putting tomatoes in the same bed year in and year out because we, we know we're going to run into problems. Uh, alternating our planting times, um, laying out your landscape the, the proper way so you've got good airflow. Um, you've got room between the plants. We're, we're not the biggest. I always get questions. Well, I want to put up a, a, a screen. I bought these shrubs and they told me to plant them on three foot centers. And uh, it's a wax myrtle and a wax myrtle is going to get 10 feet across. Well, do you really need to be planting them that that close? So understanding the plants that you are working with uh, and what the ultimate goal is, is going to be a key in order to keep those plants uh, healthy and disease free. And then therapy, 
Um, there are certain systemics. There are some fungicides that are systemic, so they will be taking up into the plant uh, and work their way through. And if the uh, spore lands and tries to, you know, penetrate the leaf surface, uh, that fungicide is in there uh, and will stop that from occurring. So there are some systemic chemicals. And then the other one is like is just pruning, getting rid of that potential that diseased uh, stem or that diseased. Uh, branch or uh, and then when you do you know as as in this image here make sure you're cleaning that blade after the fact um, because you don't want to pass that on you go out there to prune some another tree and you never know how long those spores are going to last or what it is so you always want to um, be able to uh, uh, clean that up uh, and and make sure you're working with uh, clean material clean tools uh, in order to minimize uh, the spread of the disease. All right, so let's look at some diseases. We're going to wrap this up looking at a couple diseases uh, that we see here. So here's a boxwood, and this is one that we get quite often. Uh, so we've got this boxwood, and if you notice, uh, we'll always people will say, well, it's it's got one stem that that doesn't look good. The other ones are okay, but maybe you know they're they're starting to decline. So it, if if you don't know this already, a lot of times uh, when you work in the nursery, there's more than one liner or more than one cutting that is that goes into that plant in order to get a nice full plant. So that's why sometimes, as we see here, this one is a, is is declining much faster than the other two. But we get this browning, we get this off color. You can see uh, it it just doesn't look happy. So nine times out of ten, people are going to think I I need to put more water on it. It's not getting enough water. It's drying out. Uh, What's the issue? It's actually Phytophthora root rot. The first thing when I either get a question or I get pictures or I'm, someone calls, I ask them, look at this area here where the base of the stem interfaces with the soil line. And if you see this splitting, which you see here, you can see that canker right there and the way it's split. Um, nine times out of ten, our area, it's going to be Phytophthora root rot so that the, the root rot is occurring. Um, we, we've got some issues. This is starting to split and what happens? It affects the uptake and translocation of water and nutrients. Um, the root, if you lift that out, the roots are going to be dark brown. They're going to be black. And so, as I mentioned, if you've got three cuttings or three liners in there, um, if these root, if this root system is affected, um, there are spores there, and so it's going to affect the other two liners later on, and you'll see that progression. And if you don't cut it, you know, catch it soon, um, whether it's a fungicide treatment, at this stage, I would say just lift it out. Um, you can come in and probably do a drench to be on the safe side because you don't want it going down the line. Normally, when we have these boxwoods, we've got them planted, uh, you know, in rows. Uh, they're, they're outlining a bed or something. Uh, and so uh, we'll have issues. The other problem is, uh, you know, it's, it, it is probably being overwatered too much, uh, and there's a good chance there's not enough. Boxwoods are very tight, so airflow through there is going to be an issue. So that's one of the challenges. Um, powdery mildew. Uh, this is a, a definite constant. We, do, we usually always see this early on in the season as we see new growth coming out. Uh, we may see some now, but we, we've dried out. So I would say we're probably not going to see it now, but in certain cases you might. Um, it can cause leaf drop. Um, it overwinters in the buds. So that's why a lot of times we'll see it as we get that first flush because those buds are there, the spores lay, they're dormant. Uh, and then the next thing you know, as, that, as the conditions start to uh, be ideal for the new growth to break out they're also probably those conditions are ideal for those spores to wake up and start to grow so that's why sometimes in certain varieties when you see that spring flush you'll see this powdery mildew on them and it's because uh, those spores have overwintered in those buds uh, conditions are ideal and we see that flush um, a lot of times once the conditions change things dry out we don't see uh, a lot of negative effect, but it, it just it early on it causes some issues. Um, you might see some tip die back over time, um, but usually um, it's not as big of a problem 
uh, throughout the rest of the growing season. Now we've got, here's another one, crepe myrtle. We, you know, and we've got a lot of crepe myrtles out there. So this one we can see, it, this is Cercospora. This is a leaf spot. This again is another fungal issue. Um, and we can see these circular spots here um, all throughout. It's, it's even starting to, to work its way in on, on the edges. Um, these, this foliage will eventually drop. Usually it's going to be the older foliage we're going to see it on. We're going to see it on the internal part of the plant where we're going to see it. Um, in a lot of cases, uh, if, if it's the older foliage and the new growth is healthy and doing well, um, my, my recommendation is as it falls or, or you pick it off, bag it, just get rid of it. Don't, don't let that the, that foliage sit there in that uh, litter layer, you know, down below the plant because that's potential um, spores for future uh, problems. Um, you, you're going to see it on the older foliage again, and um, usually it's 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 sort of spotty. Uh, I haven't seen it in heavy cases, at least in cr crepe myrtle. Um, mine will get it every now and then a little bit. I usually just pull off the foliage, uh, bag it, get rid of it. Uh, and then move on, and it's usually not that big of a problem. Um, but it's just something to be aware of. Uh, now, if you're seeing it on the new growth, then then we've got to do take some other issues, be, uh, take some other steps, because um, then we're going to have uh, uh, it's going to affect the the quality of the plant. Here's Entomosporum uh, on Indian hawthorn. Uh, again, and this is one where we get these uh, purplish red spots, and then we can see the color change that occurs around it. So this is textbook. Uh, and a lot of times, you know, they talk about we, we've got warm, humid weather, and then it's the air circulation. These A lot of times, you know, we use the Indian hawthorns in foundation plantings. Uh, they've been there since the house has been built. Uh, and what happens is they, they get so big and so tight that this occurs, this entomosporum uh, occurs on the lower foliage. So the next thing you know is you've only got green growth on the tips because everything else has defoliated because of this. And you can see all of the old leaves that are laying there where, you know, it's, it's another uh, a spot for these uh, spores to grow. So um, again, make sure you're, you're, you're providing an ideal growing environment for these plants in order to keep uh, these diseases at bay. Roses, powdery mildew, uh, and we've got a great area uh, for growing powdery mildew. Uh, so you can see it again on the new growth, on the top of the foliage, you're going to see it. Um, it can, can, it can, you know, coat mo much of the uh, surface of the leaf. If it's a heavy infestation, um, it will stunt the overall growth. So usually we're going to see it in the temperatures here when it's 62 to 75, which is about the time, you know, that's the temperatures we're in now. But what we're probably missing is we are not that human now. Um, so if we do get some rain or we get some wet conditions and the humidity can go up, um, we, we could see that this time of year. Usually it's in the spring. We usually don't see it in the heat of the summer um, because the temperature is too high. But this is the time of year where we get some cool mornings and we get some dew buildup and things like that. We, you know, that micro environment on that plant uh, could lead to some of that. So again, mildew, it doesn't look good. Um, you know, it's more of an aesthetic. But if you have a heavy infestation, it's going to affect the overall growth of the plant. And now we now we talk about downy mildew on roses. So this is something completely different. Um, you've got it manifests itself. Uh, you're going to see it on the top and you're going to get these uh, purplish brown spots. Now, as with the um, powdery mildew, the spores grew on the leaf surface. Uh, with downy mildew, the spores are growing on the underside. So if you flip that leaf over, you're going to see uh, yellow spots and things like that on the underside. You're going to see the spores on the underside, and then it manifests itself with this purplish brown uh, effect on the tissue on the upper side. So uh, again, spores are born uh, are are spread by uh, through the air. Uh, so if we've got an area where it's it, there's not a good uh, movement, uh, air movement, uh, and it's, it's, it's very stagnant. Uh, it's very easy for these uh, spores to grow. 
And here we can see the difference. So if we look on the underside, uh, we've got downy mildew, uh, or actually this is the young stages of downy mildew uh, on the top side of the foliage. And then we can see the spores growing here for powdery mildew, just to give you an idea of what the difference is. So if, you're, if you've got roses and you're seeing that purpling, look on the underside, you're probably gonna see the spores there. If you've got white spores on top, you're de dealing with powdery mildew. And the last one, we've all seen this. If you've grown any kind of roses here, now we are starting to, to, to you know, grow fine roses that are resistant to this, but black spot is is always been a uh, major problem. Um, these spots, they, they will have yellow rings around them uh, on both sides of the leaf. So whether you're looking on the top or the bottom, you're gonna see these spots and then this yellowing, and then you can see how it gets this water soaked look uh, over time uh, as it really takes over the plant. Um, so green leaves will go from green to yellow and then they'll drop. So when they do drop, make sure you clean that up, um, get rid of it, bag it and get it out of there. Um, and it's usually the younger leaves that are most susceptible. So the leaves that are less than two weeks old are more susceptible uh, to this fungus uh, than the older mature uh, leaves. All right, so resources, um, and actually I'm going to switch my screen here because I'd rather take you to the web, web, web websites, um, but Aggie Horticulture, uh, there's vegetable resources. This is new, this tree MD is from the Texas uh, Forest Service. Uh, I haven't had a, a, a lot of time to look at it, but it, it, it's got some good information. And then there's information here on Aggie turf. So hold on, let me switch my screen here for you real quick. Um, and then I will, let's see, here we are. Okay, so here's the vegetable resources. So this is the Aggie horticulture site. Um, and so these gardening fact sheets have, there's fact sheets on all genus of vegetables and there'll be information there but i wanted to show you this if i click on the vegetable problem solvers they've got some solvers for uh, cucurbits for tomatoes which everybody's always looking for and then there's even one for watermelon but if you click on the tomato one um you can look at the disorders whether you've got a green fruit a ripe fruit insect pest leaf stem or root and if you click on leaf, because that's usually where we're going to see a lot of the problems, um, you can see uh, some very good images. So it will help you um, be able to uh, troubleshoot what issues uh, you might have. Uh, they've even got some physiological disorders. When we talked about abiotic, you know, salt damage or phosphorus deficiency. So um, uh, the Aggie horticulture site, and if you go back to the... Uh, back here, right here, vegetable resources. Um, definitely, if you're into vegetables and you're growing them, uh, this is a site you should be aware of regardless. Uh, you should check it out. Uh, the other one is, let's see, I'll just go right down the line here. If we look at Aggie Turf, there's some, uh, this is their publications. So it's aggieturf.tamu.edu. Um, and there's some disease control, uh, if you're if you are a golf course uh, superintendent on nematode problems, but talks about fairy rings, uh, take all root rot for warm season turf grasses and then large patch. We're getting into large patch season. So that's one that's probably worth uh, taking a look at. And then that third one is right here. This tree MD. This is a new one. So um, there is an index. You can go by symptom. You can go by the type of tree. Uh, but this has just been rolled out, I think, about two weeks ago. So uh, if you are having some tree issues, um, you know, you can always look here first. Uh, and then down the road, if, if, if it's stumping you, um, we can help you out. You can always send us images. You can uh, let us know what's going on uh, and we can we can help you out with that. So uh, let me switch back here real quick. Uh, to where I was, which is. Paul, we have a few questions when you're ready. Okay, sure thing. Okay, so the first one is from Larry Leasing. Um, he says his okra is producing well, but it has a powdery mildew. Does he need to spray, or are there better cultural practices that will prevent 
in the future? He's, he's practices rotation. Um, so, well, at this time of year, you're probably coming towards the end of the season for for um, your okra. So at this point, I probably wouldn't worry about spraying. Maybe just remove that foliage, clean it up. Uh, if any fault, if any you know of the leaves have defoliated, um, you might want to uh, get them up, clean them up. Also, um, you're going to have to watch during the growing season. Uh, you might want to do some preventative sprays. Uh, early on, but if it's not, it, it, and I bet you in most cases, if it hasn't affected your production, which I know most of the okra are, are you know, they thrive down here growing quite well. Um, if it's not affecting your production uh, and you can live with it, you know, I would I would uh, live with it. If it is affecting the overall grant, uh, the, the overall growth of the plant or you're seeing um, uh reduce production uh, with regard to the fruit, uh, then go ahead and treat it. Okay, thank you. Um, the next one is from Priscilla Cope. And her question is, is it best to burn diseased plants or just throw them in the trash? Um, I, you know, it, since we're in an urban area, uh, I, I would say just bag it up, tie that bag off and, and get rid of it that way. It, now, if you're out in the country or you, you've got area where you can do burns like that, um, you can. But, you know, it, if it lays around, the longer it lays around, um, you know, there, there's always that chance that those spores are going to get out. So uh, I would say for an urban area, bag it up, toss it, get rid of it. Um, but if you do live in a country, if you're more rural and you can burn it, then you can do that also. Okay, awesome. And then the last question is um, from guests. I don't have a name. Their question is, is there an equivalent series for Bexar County where I live? If so, what is the URL? Uh, is there, so Bear County, um, so that's San Antonio. Um, they, they do not have, they're not doing uh, the homegrown, but you've got an excellent horticulture agent out there, David Rodriguez. Uh, so I would um, definitely reach out to him, um, check out their website. Um, uh, but he is, um, whether it's ornamentals or vegetables, uh, David's a, an excellent horticulture agent. So uh, I would definitely reach out to him. And uh, if you've got questions or you're seeing something different in your area, uh, he would be an excellent uh, resource to uh, work with. Okay, and that is it questions. Oh, okay. Wait, hold on. Sorry. Oh, um, Jim, uh, that? Jim Wells or Duval okay. County. I, I don't know if we have horticulture agents up there. I don't, I'm not even sure where Jim Wells County or Duval County is. Um, so what I would recommend is go, if you just Google AgriLife uh, extension and you put Jim Wells County in there or Duval County in there, uh, they will have a website and you can see who the agents are. Uh, there is always a, uh, a, a, you can always, I know they're going to have at least an, an ag and natural resources agent. Uh, so uh, you can always contact that ag and natural resources agent because he may uh, also have a horticulture background uh, and that agent, he or she will be able to help you. So um uh, that is not an issue. And if they if they can't help you, uh, they will get you in touch with someone nearby uh, that can answer your question. OK, that's it. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for joining us. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope it uh, you're 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 coming away with a nugget or two of information that you didn't uh, know before. Uh, and I just wanted to remind you all that next week, uh, same time, same station, uh, we will be here at 10 o'clock and Shannon Dietz will be talking on fall gardening ch chores. So I want to thank you all for joining us. I hope you all have a great day. Stay safe and we will see you next week. Have a good day.